But anyway, there they were in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, Marx and Engels, and they saw what was going on around them was of epochal significance, world historic significance. And they put their finger precisely on that world historical significance. The Industrial Revolution, the rise of factories, of new technologies, of new forms of power to power machines, the congregation of people into urban areas, the creation of classes. Yes, this was all new, unfolding in England. And I still stick to that phrase that I mixed up last time. <laughs> Let's see if I can get it right. That Marx had a wealth of knowledge. And Engels had the knowledge of wealth. Now, it's not entirely true because also Marx had a knowledge, had a knowledge of wealth and... And Engels had a wealth of knowledge. But basically what Engels offered was a really practical discussion of the life in Manchester. And Marx was there, the theorist. But as you'll see, that Engels too was the theorist. Only rather clearer theorist than Marx. <laughs> right. So, all right, that's point number one, who they were. Now, second, how do we move from Smith to Marx? You see, Marx and Engels were responding to two events. On the one hand, the Industrial Revolution, and on the other hand, the French Revolution. But not just to those revolutions, but to the interpreters of those revolutions. So Marx was responding to Smith's interpretation of the Industrial Revolution, and he has an alternative interpretation. Where Smith saw universal opulence, Marx, in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, saw polarization, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. That is, free trade and the division of labor didn't go with universal opulence, it went with the polarization between what he will call classes. Second, that Marx saw this tension between the potentiality of human beings and the reality of their degradation. Whereas Smith tended to see that potentiality being realized through the division of labor, with some qualifications. And Smith, third point, Smith saw his idea of free trade leading to the wealth of nations as a policy which he wanted to convince governments of pursuing against their protectionist policies of trade, against mercantilism. Whereas Marx, with his theory, wanted to convince the working class that they were the class, the revolutionary class of the future that would inaugurate a new society called communism. And finally, one can say that, Mark, that Smith really focused on individuals, individual material self-interest, whereas Marx is going to talk about individuals, but the way that individuals organize themselves into classes, groups, working class solidarity, working class struggle, the sorts of things you will not he hear anywhere in the pages of The Wealth of Nations. So, now we come to the second arm. Basically, the German ideology is Marx and Engels engaging, engaging with the, you might say, the interpreters of the French Revolution, but certainly the conveyors of the ideas behind the French Revolution, the Germans, the Germans, the German ideologists. Now, the German ideology is an intermediate text in the writings of Marx and Engels. You know, they wrote over a period of 50, 60 years. And this is an intermediate text where Marx and Engels is wrestling with the Hegelian legacy, the Hegelian legacy um, that he faces around him. He himself was a sort of young Hegelian, and he is now coming to terms with that past and trying to dissociate himself from the past. And hence, he makes a frontal assault on the Hegelians and the young Hegelians. So this text is a very fascinating text because it is Marx and Engels trying to disconnect themselves from their past and from their teachers in order to establish the foundations of the Marx and Engels, what we will examine in detail, their theory of capitalism its rise and fall, and the way it will necessarily give rise to a future society called communism.
So this is an intermediate text, and you can feel in every, in every sentence that tension. That's why it's so difficult. Yes, but we will make sense of it. Mm-hmm. Quickly, I can do this. Smith to Marx. Four things. Marx says to Smith, you talk about universal opulence. Marx says, we talk about polarization. Smith says, oh, the development of division and labor is the realization of human potentiality. Reality and potentiality come together. Marx and Engels say, no. Potentiality and reality in the world in which we live today are in tension with one another. We see everywhere the denial of human potentiality. Third, Smith says, oh, so what is important about history is the development of the division of labor, and that means specialization, and that is all based on an assumption about individuals that they are indeed pursuing a material self-interest. Marx and Engels say, yes, there are individuals in society, but there are also things you don't recognize, Smith, classes, groups, notions of solidarity, and struggle between groups. Fourth, Smith says, oh, these governments, they want to control, distort the free market. We need to have a policy of open, free trade. Marx and Engels said, you have open and free trade, and you will have all the sorts of consequences, not of universal opulence, but of polarization, My theory, Marx says, is not aimed at some government, but is aimed at the increasing mass of wage laborers who I am going to encourage Marx and Engels, they're going to encourage, we are going to encourage Marx and Engels, say, to organize themselves into a class where Smith talks about science and policy making by the state, Marx is going to talk about science and revolution. That's Smith. And it's really, it's a critique of Smith's understanding of what is going to be the Industrial Revolution. But Marx and Engels are sitting in the middle of it. Smith is only anticipating it. And it is amazing that we are still reading Smith today, even though he was living before the Industrial Revolution. Extraordinary. So, both great theorists. And in the mid-semester you will be writing a paper in which will involve them talking to one another. Yes, indeed. All right, that was Smith to Marx. Now, Hegel to Marx. Well, it's in the German ideology. Hegel himself, uh, Marx himself, was indeed a young Hegelian. He, too, believed in the importance of ideas in the beginning. But now he's wrestling with that past and trying to break with that past. Marx and Engels say to Hegel and the younger Galeans, you're just a bunch of idealists who think that ideas is what drives history. Yes, you younger Galeans think you're very radical in criticizing Hegel and his spirituality and in bringing down from heaven to earth Hegel's ideas. And, but you too, young Hegelians, you are worshipping an abstraction, the abstraction Species being the potentiality of human beings, the abstract idea of humans. And, but, 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 Marx says to the young Galeans, you are an advance over Hegel, because Hegel thinks, like Smith, that the existing world is the perfect world. But you, you young Galeans, are recognizing there is a discrepancy between the potentiality, abstraction man, and reality. At least you recognize that discrepancy. But you recognize it in a totally passive way. And we, Marx and Engels, are going to see it in a much more active way. And we're going to start not with potentiality, but with the reality. The real social relations into which men and women enter as they create the conditions of their existence. Yeah. Which brings us to point number three of the summary. Which are the break. The four premises of all history. 
And this is the break. This is Marx and Engels establishing the foundations of their own theory. And the first premise is, if there is to be history, there have to be human beings. If there are going to be human beings, they've got to live. And if they're going to live, they have to produce the means of their existence. They have to produce the means of their existence. They have to produce food, shelter, clothing, and so on. First premise. The second premise, about which we had a great discussion last time, and I do not want to recapitulate it. Namely, one need leads to another need. The satisfaction of the first need leads to another need. And that is there, in my view, because Marx wants to have a very general claim about the inevitability, the ne inevitability of historical change. For Marx and Engels, history is not something static, that something changes. And to, have, to make that claim about history as something that changes, he wants something equally general in terms of his premise. Premise number two, one needs leads to another need. That's the dynamism, the mechanism through which history changes. That's point number two. Point number three. It's no good just having one generation of people and then the human species dies out. If there is to be history, you have to have a continuity. One generation has to give rise to another generation. Procreation. And there, interestingly, he says, it takes place in the family. Mm -hmm. About which we will talk more later. And finally, fourth, that as men and women produce... As one need leads to another need, as men and women procreate, they enter into social relations. They enter into social relations. They enter into social relations. The units of analysis are sets of, use of social relations, not individuals. Individuals slot into social relations. Individuals, human beings, are not human beings until they enter into social relations with one another. And... Then, Marx and Engels say, consciousness emerges out of this. Consciousness is, in a sense, a reflection of these four premises. And perhaps I should read to you page 155. Summary, let me do a brief one, then we get into communism. Let's see if I can do it. I have, basically, with, without communism, I've got six points. Let's see. Okay. See if I can do it in seven minutes. One. Four premises of all history. First, production. Human beings must produce the means of their existence. Second, one need leads to another need. Satisfaction of first need leads to another need. Third, procreation through the family. Fourth, as people produce the means of existence, procreating one need leads to another, they enter into social relations. Point number two. These social relations have two dimensions. The two dimensions of the division of labor. The first dimension is the Smithian dimension. That is, the idea of division of labor as specialization. The idea of division of labor as a division of production. The idea of division of labor as a mode of cooperation. The idea of division of labor as who does what, with whom, with what. The idea of division of production. As opposed to the second dimension of the division of labor, which is... Who owns what? What happens to the product, the division of the product? The idea of property relations. The idea of who gets what, from whom, and how. The distribution of the surplus. How is it appropriated and then redistributed? That is the second dimension. The first dimension, technically, is often referred to as the forces of production, that the relations into which we enter as we transform nature, our capacity to transform nature. The second is technically known as the relations of production, the ways in which surplus is produced and appropriated and redistributed. Appropriation and redistribution. So there are two dimensions to the division of labor, otherwise known as the mode of production. Uh -huh. 
So we then moved on to the family. Can we see the two-dimensional division of labor in the family? Yes, we can. We can see it in Marx and Engels, in the German ideology. On the one hand, who does what? Basically, that who does what is determined by people's physical abilities, capacities, biological dispositions. That's one meaning of the word natural, natural dispositions. On the one hand, and on the other hand, he says, well, yes, who gets what? Latent slavery in the family. Women and children are, in a sense, in quote, H. Marx, metaphorically slaves. Uh -huh. Slaves of the paterfamilia, the father, figure, who owns their labor and the products of their labor. Yeah. So that's the latent slavery in the family, the two dimensions. And this is not part of the summary. Let me tell you. So, from the family, we moved on to the question of saying there are divisions of labor, two types. One, based on classes, and others without classes. What is a class? Well, we figured it out from Marx, though he didn't explicate, explicitly say so. He said, well, when there's a division of mental and manual labor, that is when division of labor truly begins. That is when there are classes, because if there are mental workers who specialize in mental work, there has to be another class that produces their means of existence. That means there's a one class that appropriates surplus from another class. That is what a class is, one group appropriating surplus from another group. So we said, well, there are class modes of production, ancient mode of production, that is, slaves and slave owners, feudalism, lords and serfs, capitalism, capitalists and workers. Then we said, well, possibly the tribal society is or is not a motor, uh, class mode of production. On page 739 or wherever it was, Engels was saying it was. Whereas on page 151, they were saying it wasn't. So there's some confusion here. Perhaps it is the case that different tribal societies have a different class character. Some are class, some are not. Okay. And then we move to communism. That definitively is a non-class division of labor. Abolition of classes. Surplus is produced, but it is collectively controlled and redistributed, as we will see in a few minutes. Yes. And that was a summary. Let me summarize very quickly. One. Point number one, history. History for Smith is the advance of the division of labor. History for Hegel is the unfolding of consciousness. History for Marx and Engels is the succession of modes of production. That's the first notion of history in Marx and Engels. We'll have other ones later. Second, all oh right, I've got to draw you a picture here. This is the picture of where we are. This is a picture of where we are. Okay. Well, we start with classless, classless tribal society. We move then to class tribal society. And I'm just dividing tribal society into two types. Um, to get over this apparent contradiction in Marx and Engels. Then, according to Marx and Engels, we have the ancient mode of production based on citizens and slaves. Then we have the feudal mode of production based on lords and serfs. Then we have capitalism based on capitalism uh, workers. And then we have, finally, communism. And the history goes like this. Clockwise, starting over here. Now, what are the dimensions? Well, Marx and Engels will say here we have low development of the forces of production. And here in communism and capitalism, we have high development of the forces of production. And why? We'll have to examine that. And here, well, the re here we're going to talk about the relations of production, the other dimension of the division of labor. Here we have communal relations, communal relations of production, communal property relations, and here we have private property, private property. So that's where we are. Now, this communism, in the German ideology, this communism will involve the abolition abolition of private property and the introduction of collective ownership uh -huh. whatever that means not spelled out collective ownership okay and then also what goes with that as a consequence is the abolition of specialization 
OK. And the voluntary division of labor, people choosing to do what they want in relation with others, developing their multiple talents. Now, that's the German ideology. But then in third volume of volume three of Capital, we have a recognition that even under communism, you have to produce the means of existence. And so you have a realm of necessity, realm of necessity, and a realm of freedom. Realm of freedom is where you really develop your rich and varied abilities, which rests upon the realm of necessity, which is where you produce the means of existence. Produce that which is necessary for needs, realm of necessity. I know you can't read it, but you should know it by heart by now. And the whole point is to reduce the time spent in the realm of necessity. Reduce the length of working day. And that is possible because of the development of technology on the one side, under capitalism, and on the other side, it's possible because we are no longer going to produce all sorts of things that are peculiar to capitalism and the class character of capitalism. That's it. Okay. Summary. One. Division of labor has two components. Who does what and who gets what? Otherwise known as the forces and relations of production. And otherwise, together, they are known as the mode of production. So the division of labor is a... Or mode of production is another way of labeling division of labor with its two dimensions. So the history then becomes a succession, a succession of modes of production, a succession of divisions of labor. And it goes as follows. We start with some tribal. You know, they never talk about a tribal mode of production, um, which is interesting. But anyway, a tribal economy. Then we go to the ancient mode of production defined by slaves and masters, or slaves and citizens. Then we go to the feudal mode of production, lords and serfs. Then to capitalism, capitalism workers. And then finally to a classless world of communism. Yes, yeah, so that, that's, that's the sort of sequential view of history. And as we will see through history, the forces of production, our capacity to transform nature continually increases. And it is that expansion of the forces of production, our capacity to transform nature, to be ever more productive, that lays the foundations of the very possibility of communism, which is the reduction of the length of the working day. The realm of necessity, the production of the means of our existence, according to page 441, the, mean, the realm of necessity has to become smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer hours a day or fewer days a week, in order that we may have indeed a realm of freedom where we develop our rich and varied abilities in relation with others. Yep. And I pointed out to you the contradiction between the German ideology's vision of communism, in which there does not appear to be a realm of necessity, and the paragraph at the top of page 441, which actually refers to the realm of necessity and the realm of freedom. Yeah. So, next we started talking about these different modes of production of different classes in these different modes of production. Communism, no classes. To understand communism, you have to understand capitalism. But in order to understand capitalism, you've got to understand feudalism. Feudalism, you need to understand the ancients. So basically, we started with work of what? Comparing serfs and slaves. And the difference between a serf and a slave is that a slave sells him or herself to a slave owner. That is what is bought and sold. The slave is bought and is then, in a sense, enslaved to the slave owner, works on the plantation to produce the means of existence for themselves and for the slave owners, and perhaps to produce surplus that will then be traded. Yes, Cliné? Very good, very good, very good, very good, very good. Slaves are captured. 
And then those who capture them, own them, and sell them. There is a trade in human beings. You're absolutely right. The, the slave does not actually sort of voluntarily sell him or herself to a slave owner. Very good. Very good. Very imprecise of me. Yes. Yes. And that, of course, to a large extent in the 16th, 17th century, that's what colonialism was all about, was bringing, bringing, bringing slaves, capturing slaves, appropriating slaves from their homes and bringing them to the United States and other parts of the Americas where they are bought and sold in an auction and become owned by the slave owner. Very good. The serf, on the other hand, the serf, on the other hand, does not, it does not, is not involved in a sale of the human body, the human being, but the serf actually gives up a certain amount of labor to the Lord in order to cultivate the means of his or her own existence. What that means is that the serf actually pays rent to the Lord in order to actually cultivate land for their own subsistence. So they are giving up, not laborer, but labor. And so we drew a picture, we drew a picture of feudalism Oops. that looked as follows. And this, of course, is a model to help us understand capitalism. So, feudalism is a very complicated world, much far more complicated than we would ever have time to talk about in this class. But for the purpose of this class, we have the feudal family, the, the serfs family, cultivating on land held at the will of the Lord their own subsistence. So this is necessary labor, necessary for their subsistence, for their existence. That, shall we say, is four days a week. And to hold that land at the will of the Lord, they have to actually also cultivate land on the, cultivate on the Lord's land, the Lord's domain, as it is known. And this is the surplus labor. It's a class society, there though has to be a surplus. Sur and here we shall say is there two days a week. Two days. And what is happening is the Lord is sitting in his manor and making sure that the serfs are working. Yes, yes. There are four things I want to say about feudalism. I say these four things because they are all contrast, contrasts with capitalism. First, the serf produces, or the serfs produce their own means of existence. The serfs produce their own means of subsistence. Second, Necessary and surplus labor are separated in space and in time. Separated in space and in time. It is clear that the serf is being exploited in as much as they produce surplus for the Lord. Exploitation is transparent. Surplus and necessary labor are separated in space and time. Third, because exploitation is transparent, because surplus labor is clearly separate from necessary labor, so it has to be justified. So there has to be a process of legitimation. And all sorts of legitimations are used by the lords. Well, the lords say to the serfs, we'll protect you from other lords. The Lord say, this is always how it's been done. You are a serf and that is your destiny, to work for a Lord. For me in particular. It is God's will that you actually be a serf and therefore render rent to the Lord. But sometimes legitimation doesn't work. Sometimes the serfs rebel and 
In those, those occasions, the Lord has access to an army, a retinue of retainers. Basically, a sort of small military apparatus which will ensure that actually those serfs stick to their destiny working for the Lord on the Lord's land in exchange for which they have access to their own land. Well, land held at the will of the Lord. So that is the third point, legitimation and coercion. And the fourth point, work is organized here collectively. Well, collectively. It's organized probably collectively and on the basis of families. The serf families organize work to produce subsistence on these strips of land. Whereas here, work is organized as is laid down in the manorial courts, specific activities. The serfs have to engage in specific activities at specific times of the year. It is all defined beforehand and orchestrated and regulated by the supervisor who acts on behalf of the Lord, the bailiff. Yes. So the fourth point is, how is work organized? The forces of production, you might say. Self-organization on the land here, and work defined by the Lord here. Those are the four points I want to stress with regard to feudalism. Any questions? Good. Now you were very good last time in quoting from Marx and Engels, Wage, Labor and Capital. So I let the discussion roam along and now I want to summarize that discussion and on wage labor that we began last time. And there are six points I'm afraid I want to get across. So rather than having another discussion, I want to be very clear what my six points are about wage labor. Now, wage labor is indeed the dominated, the subordinate class under capitalism. Capitalism made of capitalists and wage laborers. We are now talking about the wage laborer. In a few minutes, we will talk about the capitalist. But in practice, you really can't talk about the wage labor without simultaneously talking about the capitalist, as we will see. But we're going to look now at the perspective of capitalism from below. And what we're going to do is distinguish between the wage laborer on the one side and the serf and the slave on the other, as we did last time. All right, here we go. Point number one. Wage laborers do not produce the means of their existence do not produce the means of their subsistence. They do not have access to strips of land. In fact, they are expropriated from their land. They are pushed off the land so that they don't have access to the means of subsistence. Their land is enclosed. They're expelled from the land. And they come to town. So that's the first point. Wage laborers do not produce the means of their subsistence. The second point. How do these workers, expelled from the land, survive? Well, they have to look for somebody who will pay them money, we call it a wage, to, so that they can buy their means of subsistence. So that they can buy the means of their subsistence. So the second point, workers survive by receiving a wage. What they have to do, and this is the third point, they have to find a capitalist who needs their labor, their labor activity, their labor, and who can afford to pay them a wage. So they're looking for a capitalist who will give them a wage. Now the question is this, what do those workers give in return to the capitalist? Yes. And that's where we have to look at the text. And we looked at it last time on page 204. 
And there, what did we discover? We discovered that the workers actually don't give up labor as such. What they don't sell is labor, but they sell what? Very good. They sell labor power. And you can look on page two. Fo- so, the third paragraph, new paragraph in the new sec- or second new section, it goes, the capitalist, it seems, therefore, buys their labor with money. They sell him their labor for money. But this is merely the appearance. In reality, what they sell to the capitalist for money is their labor power. The capitalist buys this labor power for a day, a week, a month, etc. And after he has bought it, he uses it by having the workers work for the stipulated time. Well, there's a lot contained in those two sentences, three sentences. How does he get those people to deliver that labor? Because he's only buying the labor power, the capacity. Yes. So, that's right. On the end of that paragraph, labor power, therefore, is a commodity, neither more nor less than sugar. The former is measured by the clock, the latter by the scales. So, labor power is something that is bought and sold. So, the laborer gives up labor power in exchange for a wage. Right. That is point number three. Now, what is labor power? This is point number four. What is it they actually sell? Well, as we talked about it last time, it is the potential, the capacity to work. The potential, the capacity to work. Yes. Yes. So he says, and there he, on page 205, we talked about it before, he contrasts labor power with the laborer and labor activity. So what is sold is this capacity. Now, that's point number four. Now, in point number five is, what is the value of this labor power? Well, the value of the labor power, according to Marx and Engels, is the amount of labor that goes into producing labor power, into producing the capacity to work. Now, what is the labor that goes into the production of labor power? It is none other than the feeding and clothing and sheltering of the worker, of the laborer. But not just the laborer, but also the renewal of the laborer through successive generations. Therefore, the wage must cover the what? The the family must cover not only the laborer, but future laborers. So in a sense, must cover the upkeep of the family. It is both the maintenance of the laborer and the renewal of the labor force. So a wage is a family wage. That's on page 206. Yes, that was point number five. And now we come to the last point. Point number six. Why do Marx and Engels refer to free labor free labor actually where is it they are on page 205 it's about the middle of the page whoa 2 4 6 8 10 12 14 16 18 from the top he says labor was not always wage labor that is free labor what is free about this labor that is exploited. What is free? Yes, Nicolette. That the laborer is free to choose who works. Excellent. The laborer is free to choose which capitalist they would desire, want to, willing to work for. But, Nicolette, but they have to do what? Domini, they have to work for some capitalist, and therefore, Mohammed, they are what? They are what? Enslaved to, chained to. Let's use the word, not use the word slave, because it has a very specific meaning. They're enchained to the capitalist class. So they appear to be free in their choice, and that is not an insignificant freedom but ultimately they are chained to the capitalist class. They have to sell themselves to some capitalist 
And if they don't, what happens to them? They disappear, they die. Well, right, summary. What I want to do is to give you a picture of feudalism and capitalism according to the theory of Marx and Engels. Okie dokie. Let's see if we can do this together and quickly. Feudalism. Feudal mode of production and a capitalist mode of production. If you're interested, if you're writing this down, it's going to go into two boards. Oops, no, that doesn't, already made a mistake. Let's put it here. Okay, we've got another column here. Source of subsistence. Source of subsistence. How do people survive? Under feudalism, produce the means of a direct production. Direct production. They produce the means of their own subsistence on the plots of land they hold at the will of the Lord. And the capitalism, how do the wage laborers survive? I'm listening. They work for a wage. They sell their what? Very good for a wage. They are dispossessed of access to the means of their subsistence. Therefore, they sell their labor power, their capacity to work for a wage. And that wage is what? Is what is the wage? The wage is that which is necessary to produce labor power. It is what keeps the family going, which maintains the labor force and renews the labor force. That is what the wage is. Yes. Now, the form of surplus. Form of surplus. We're into the relations of production. What's the form of surplus under feudalism? What did you say? Carrots. What did you say, Veronese? Carrots. What do we call it first? What do we call it? Agriculture. That's not what we call the surplus. Kyle, what do we call it? You weren't here last time. You don't remember. Yes. Jaime. Tribute. Well, it's actually called... Very good. Very good. Okay. And this rent is in money. It's in kind. But we do it in labor. Okay. So it's laboring on the land of the Lord. So there's a separation in space and time between the necessary labor on the plots of land and the surplus labor on the Lord's land. That's what we had here four days and two days, just for example. But the point is separation in space and time. Now the question is, that is a relation of exploitation because surplus is taken by one group from another group. Now, what is the name of the surplus, the former surplus under capitalism? Profit. Yes. And how does the profit appear? What is profit? It comes from... Zach. Surplus labor. So well, where does profit come from then? Can somebody say, Andrew? The productive powers of labor above and beyond that which is necessary above and beyond the value of the wage. And so we think of the work day, eight hours, four hours is surplus, which is four hours is necessary. We think we're paid for eight hours, we're actually paid for four hours, and the thing is that capitalists are able to extract more labor from workers than is embodied in what they get in the wage. Labor power, this ultimately goes to profit. This is the wage. Okay, now what is significant here is what? Is that it is not clear where necessary labor ends and surplus labor begins. There is indeed a fusion of surplus and necessary labor, 
And therefore, in a sense, exploitation is invisible. We think we're paid for eight hours, but we're only paid for four. There is no separation of the necessary and surplus labor. Invisible exploitation. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does exist, but it's not transparent. Right. Good. It's what we did last time. Now. So, the realization, the realization of surplus. Oops. Where does surplus appear in the feudalism? Well, it appears on the, in front of the nose, in front of the eyes of the Lord. It's direct. The realization is direct in the form of labor, or of money, or of kind. Form of, let's call it just labor. And where is profit realized? Where do we f think profit is realized, Jaime? In capital. Where do capital... Yes, Emily. What? Well, your realization of where is it realized? Well, here it's direct. Where do capitalists think that profit comes from? We said it last time, Dominique. From the market. We think we sell something at a higher price than it costs us to produce. We think that profit emerges from the market. That's what all those neoclassical economists think. Emerges from market. We think that profit is actually a return to the risk that capitalists make. A reward for their innovation and an entrepreneurship. There are all sorts of arguments. Marx is saying that is their appearances. In reality, it comes from labor. Now, next line is forces of production. What are the forces of production? What are the forces of production? What do forces of production mean? What, does for, what, do forces, what do we mean by the forces of production? Ariel? Specialization. The forces of production are what? They involve machinery, specialization. It is our capacity to transform nature. And so how is the transformation of nature organized under feudalism? Come on, come on, come on. Yes. Hmm? Through the family. So there's self-organization. Self-organization on the plots of land where the serfs cultivate their means of existence. And how is it organized on the Lord's land? Bailiff organizes according to stipulated tasks for each family. Yeah, so fixed obligations on the Lord's land. Fixed obligations. Now, how does work get organized under capitalism? Now that we didn't quite do. We started, we hinted at it. We did have a little bit of a discussion. How is work organized under capitalism? The capitalist mode of production. Yes, Sammy. Uh, the worker chooses the capitalist to work for. But we're talking about the organization of work in, shall we say, the factory, in the workplace. Aha, 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 aha. It is a division of labor, but how is that division of labor organized as compared with feudalism? As compared with feudalism, Jaron. Yes, the labor power is harnessed by different capitalists, that's right. That is to do more with the relations of production. But how is work itself organized? You mentioned something about skills, so now you're on to the right track, Alyssa. Under capitalism. Who's the he now? 
the owner of the factory decides. Okay, now what is, very good. The owner of the factory decides, but how does this, what, what is so distinctive about the way that work is organized under capitalism as compared with feudalism, Andrew? There are managers over workers, yes, but there's still something distinctive, Nicolette. That's like the bailiff. Bureaucracy. Hmm. No, no, well, there may be bureaucracy, but there's, this is self-organization on the land of the serfs and fixed, fixed obligations, fixed obligations, fixed obligations uh, on the Lord's land. Yes, we got... Casey. Is it per hour? Yes, people are paid per hour, but that's not how work is organized. You're telling me always about relations of production. I want to know how work is organized. Work is organized, Katie. Each worker has a specific task. Each worker has a specific task, fixed obligations. Is that capitalism, Ali? Uh, competition forces managers to constantly change. Competition forces managers to change how they organize change how they organize production. Why, Emily? Answer, Mike. What say? What you're going to say? Hmm? It's absolutely very good. It is socially organized, collective labor in the factory. But there's something else that Ali was getting on. I getting to. Yes. Yeah, and so uh, constantly it's constantly changing. What is constantly changing? Excellent. Uh, so there's a pattern that gets changes, so what changes? Very good. Bullseye so far. Can you do another one? What is constantly changing? Cliné. That may be, but that's relations. I'm interested in the organization of production. Uh huh. Very nice. So what is so? What is actually changing concretely? Yes, you're all on the round. Hmm? Technology is always changing, Ali. The jobs in the workplace. The jobs in the workplace. So the point is, Sander. That the labor is constantly changing. Yes, the whole work process is constantly changing constantly changing as we will see because of competition we haven't worked it out yet but competition among capitalists leads them to change continuously the whole point about feudalism was its static character fixed obligations or self-organization under capitalism it's the continuous transformation of work that is why you sell labor power not a specific labor continuous transformation yes Oh, of work. Which will entail being people, new people being hired, old people being fired. It will entail new jobs, new machines. Management has the exclusive right to transform the work process and does so. It's the dynamism of capitalism that, as we'll see, comes from competition. Okay. Now we get to an interesting line, the last line. And I'm going to call it ideology and politics. We'll learn what these are in a minute. Well, not in a minute, over the course of the semester. But what I'm asking is, how do we maintain this system under feudalism? The exploitation is transparent, right? Remember, transparent is clear, separating space and time. How does that continue through a process of, Andrew? Legitimation, justification. It has to, you have to justify. You have to justify the exploitation of the serfs. Justification of exploitation of surplus extraction, which is the same thing. And you do that by saying, well, this is God's will. This is how it's always been done. This is because we're one big family. And I'm going to protect you from other lords. These are the justifications. These Smurfs know all about it down here. Uh, I am always taking them out for feasts and building identity. And they're so happy. Let's look at them. Happy Smurfs. Yes. But sometimes the legitimation doesn't work. 
And then, what is there? Coercion. So we should say legitimation, justification, legitimation, plus force. The point is, the lords have an army to back them up, if necessary. Now, the final squat box, and the most important and interesting one. How does capitalism reproduce itself? How do the class relations of capitalism reproduce itself? How do the relations of production of capitalism reproduce themselves? How is it that exploitation continues? Soma. Um, it is the only way workers can get their means of subsistence their means of existence. So they, compulsion is an <laughs> It's an economic one. It's an economic compulsion. You go to work, you get in return a wage, the wage you put in your pocket, you then buy the means of subsistence that enables you to survive a day and then you go next day to work again. You have to. It's economic compulsion. Yes, economic compulsion. Economic compulsion. The relations of production reproduce themselves of themselves. Yes. Economic compulsion. Do you therefore need to justify capitalism? No, why not? Why not? Somebody said no. Golly. Because surplus is invisible. People don't really feel, no, experience that exploitation. Huh? Summary. I want to first compare feudalism and capitalism once again. And as follows, the relations of production under feudalism, we have laborers, direct producers, giving up labor to the Lord. Instead of, under capitalism, they give up labor power, that is the capacity to work. Second, the surplus under feudalism is transparent. It's separated in space and time from necessary labor. Whereas under capitalism, it is hidden, it's obscure, it's opaque. Nobody knows where the line between surplus and necessary labor lies. It looks invisible because you seem to be paid as a worker for all the time you spend at work. Third, what we, the surplus manifests itself under capitalism as, uh, under feudalism as rent. Under capitalism, it emerges as profit that seems to come from the market. So all those three things are the relations of production. The forces of production, as we've just underlined, for feudalism, it seems to be fixed. The amount of work you do for the Lord, the character of the work, whereas, and it's somewhat fixed even in your own land where you're producing subsistence. Whereas under capitalism, the whole point about capitalism is it's dynamic, it's always changing, so therefore capitalists have to be able to take the capacity and turn it into variable forms of labor. The work process is continually changing. In the one case, you have a relatively static mode of production, and in the other case, because of competition, a dynamic one. So that's my first part of my summary. The second part of my summary is not the comparison of feudalism and capitalism so much as the comparison of what Engels calls individual production, individual production, and capitalist production. So, let me just represent that. Relations of production under individual production and this is capitalist production. So who, under individual production, this is the Smithian world. This is the Smithian world in which what? Individuals produce and own what they produce. So the relations of production, who appropriates what? Individuals appropriate the product that they themselves produce. Private appropriation. 
Under capitalism, what do we have? We have the same. We only now would have individual capitalists appropriate what others do, but it's still private appropriation. Private appropriation of the product. The forces of production. Now this is where it shifts. Here we have individual producers, craft workers if you will, petty commodity producers, peasants who produce the means of their own subsistence and perhaps even some surplus, but they produce it themselves and actually hold on to their products. Whereas here, it's not individual production, it's socialized production. But now we have socialized production in the factory, workers in the chocolate factory who are interdependent with one another, who are put in motion by management, who gives them a wage, but they do not actually usually appropriate except occasionally that which they produce. It's socialized or collective production. So there's a shift from individual production to capitalist production in Engels' formulation. And then there's going to be another shift to communism. Now what happens under communism? Open this up with this beautiful picture. It's the one we had last time. Anarchy, anarchy, anarchy of the market. Um, Engels is really talking here about what? Competition among capitalists. Competition among capitalists. Though, of course, he could also be talking about competition among workers. Anarchy of the worker, on the one hand, versus the planned division of labor in the factory. This is the socialized productive forces. Yep, planned division of labor in the factory. Yep, planned production. Why? Because the market leads to the competition and then the competition leads capitalists to organize work in the best possible way so that they can advance their profitability. What does this mean? Well, first of all, they try and de-skill workers. Workers often come to the workplace with craft skills, but if they can de-skill them, that means that they are controllable more easily, that means that they are replaceable, and that means also that they have lower wages, because lower skilled workers have lower wages. So reduce the skill, introduce new machinery, And new machinery, according to Marx and Engels, actually, first of all, displaces workers into the reserve army of unemployed, where they can be, in a sense, used to discipline those who are at work, who fear that they will lose their jobs. And on the other hand, it also, according to Marx and Engels, de-skills the workers. If you have a machine, then basically what you need, according to Marx and Engels, are people to tend the machine. That is an unskilled job. And then there are other strategies that capitalists use, family labor. That is to distribute the labor amongst two or three members of the family, which means you can reduce the wage that each of them gets. Yes. And this leads, the combination leads to unemployment and lowering of wages. Very good. And that leads to the polarization, polarization between the wealthy, that's the capitalists, and the poor, which is the working class. Accumulation of wealth at one pole and poverty at the other. The capitalists are becoming wealthy because they are impoverishing the working class and increasing the rate of exploitation. Yes. Now, that leads in two directions. On the one hand, it leads to, according to Engels, class struggle. Class struggle. Class struggle because what is happening is that there is a polarization between the capitalist class and the proletariat. And as this polarization is the result of the Rich, taking from the poor, this antagonism leads, leads, says Engels, to class struggle, to class struggle. 
On the other hand, it also leads to crises of overproduction because the wages are falling, but more and more is being produced because of increased in productivity, but there are fewer and fewer consumers to actually purchase that which is being produced because the working class is shrinking and is actually losing its capacity to consume because wages are falling. Competitive capitalism. And what happens? Competitive capitalism leads to competition among capitalists. And competition among capitalists leads to the introduction of de-skilling, new machines, displacement, lower wages, unemployment, and polarization, which leads on the one hand to class struggle, and on the other hand to To, to, Kevin, crises of overproduction. You've written this picture down 20 times already, which then leads to, class struggle leads to, whoops, more, 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 seizing state power, and then the crisis of overproduction leads to concentration of capital, conditions of cap communism. This is the story. That's the story that Marx has. Now, or Engels has. Now, what, is, what does Engels say about these crises of overproduction? What effect do they have on the perception of workers? Ariel. That the capitalists are incompetent because it seems that they can only create crises. Okay, incompetent capitalists. Incompetent caps. And what else? They're incompetent, but also they are, yes, Casey, are necessary because, unnecessary because, unnecessary because, Emily, the administrators are doing the managing and the capitalists are doing the Coupon clipping. How can you forget coupon clipping? That's the only thing you should remember from this class. Capitalists spend their time coupon clipping. Coupon clipping. So capitalists are actually unnecessary for production. Unnecessary caps. And this leads the working class to see that what? Exploitation is palpable. Palpable. So... My answer to your question is, if we want to take this sentence seriously, then, and the capitalism, in principle, exploitation is invisible. But there comes a time when class struggle intensifies and the crisis deepens, that it becomes visible, brutal, clear. Summary, yes, all right. Yes. Um, this is what we decided. We decided that, no, we didn't. I did. I decided that this was a brilliant theory and just had a couple of flaws. We're going to actually talk about three flaws, but it was brilliant theory. It nearly came true. Nearly came true. And I'm going to talk on Tuesday as to really why it didn't come true. Um, and the answer lies in the three flaws of this theory. Now, first, before the flaws, what is the theory? Basically, it's the idea of competitive capitalism, defined above all as competition among capitalists, um, Competing for profit, driving down wages, increasing the reserve army of unemployed, actually creating crises of overproduction on the one side and class struggle through polarization of wealth and poverty on the other. Intensification of class struggle, exploitation becomes palpable, Crisis deepen, monopolies develop, trust develop, 
banks begin to control the economy, and we get the seeds of an emerging socialization of the relations of production, of property relations. On the one side, the intensification of struggle. On the other, working class seizes state power, and Bob's your uncle. Bob's your uncle. You get communism. Right. Yeah. Well, there are three flaws here. The first is no transition theory. No theory of transition. It just got Bob's your uncle. If you use Bob's your uncle in your papers, you better cite a reference outside this lecture. No theory of transition. We don't know really how it works to move from capitalism to communism. It really does not tell us. <coughs> and there's a beginning of an answer in these pages, but still not very adequate. No theory of transition. Second, an undeveloped theory of the, of the state. Are sentences scattered here and there that contain almost a brilliant insight, so brilliant that they didn't even understand what the insight was. Namely, namely that the state, namely that the state can actually equilibrate, stabilize capitalism by regulating the relations among the capitalists so they continue to compete, antitrust laws but the competition is not too great so that it wipes capitalism out. So there are all sorts of protections for different sectors, for different national industries, and some industries are even nationalized. On the one side and the other side, the state actually ensures that class struggle leads to concessions to the working class, concessions of the character of minimum wage legislation, the reduction of the length of the working day, increasing wages over time, unemployment compensation, welfare, participation in the electoral arena so that they can support the parties they desire, all sorts of ways in which the working class can make gains within capitalism so the class struggle is not the grave digger of capitalism, but in the end turns out to be the savior of capitalism because it is through those concessions that the crises of overproduction are also offset because it is through the struggle and the reforms that the working class are able to demand and realize. It realizes also the increase of their consumption power and that offsets to some extent these crises. So instead of... Bob's your uncle communism, you get Aunt Sally's organized capitalism. Organized capitalism. Organized by what? The state. And so the third, the third, the third flaw in this theory is a flawed theory of You're not so sure about that one. Of class struggle. The flawed theory of class struggle is the theory that Marx and Engels enunciate in the Communist Manifesto and presume elsewhere, namely that once the condi objective conditions of the working class become so degraded, they then engage in struggle, small struggle, scattered struggles lead to the formation of trade unions, formation of political parties, political parties, socialist, communist parties who are able to organize themselves nationally based on the improvement of communications. The working class is dragged into the political arena by the bourgeoisie fighting with other bourgeoisies. So there is a politicization of the working class and at the same time an intensification of its struggles. Struggle leads to more struggle, leads to more struggle, leads to more struggle, leads eventually to seizing of state power. And it turns out that struggle leads to reform 
and reform leads working class to actually struggle for gains within capitalism without going beyond capitalism. That capitalism showed itself to be what? Very flexible, very adaptable, much more so than Marx and Engels ever anticipated. Yeah. Let me summarize. I think I got four points, says here. One, a question of socialism. One of the distinctive features of all Marxism, Pimvi asked me what makes, I think, I've forgotten who it was, but somebody asked me, what makes all these theorists Marxists? Well, one way, one, one, one distinction is that they believe in a world beyond capitalism. They theorize capitalism, and they believe that there can be a world beyond capitalism. And that world that they call socialism or communism. And in the night between 1890 and 1920, as I said last time, socialism was really on the agenda. It was a serious project that many people were engaged in, many fractions of the working class. And the center, the epicenter of that debate and discussion about socialism um, was in Germany. The trouble with that debate, in part, was that there was no real attempt to figure out what this socialism really was. It was assumed capitalism doomed and will make socialism. It could only be better than capitalism. It will reject many of the features of capitalism. But the concrete features of this alternative were never spelled out. And the only question was, when will capitalism dissolve and disappear or destroy itself and be overthrown? So that was the period 1890 to 1920. Then socialism becomes a reality, you might say, in the Soviet Union. And we have what is called communism, Soviet communism. Now this was made under the most difficult of circumstances and in no way, and in no way approximates to the vision of communism as Marx and Engels wrote about it in the German ideology or on page 441. But it was called communism by the dominant class, by the party elite, to justify their domination. This is often seen as a very distorted pathological form of communism. It involved not democracy but dictatorship. After the Second World War, and that, and that regime, of course, continued until 19, well, in Eastern Europe, 1989, and the Soviet Union until 1991. After the Second World War, there were lots of movements for colonial independence, and many of those movements for colonial independence had as their vision and ideology some notion of socialism. And often it was a notion of socialism that was very much at odds with what was going on in the Soviet Union, a much more democratic character. So many of the anti-colonial struggles had a socialist flavor. And many of the new regimes claimed to be socialist. Such regimes as in Mozambique, regimes perhaps in Tanzania. In the end, again, they did not really approximate to what we have called communism in this class. Yes. They struggled under very difficult circumstances because these were largely impoverished countries to create an alternative to the capitalism of the West. And, of course, the leading country in this complex of countries seeking an alternative was China. And China sought through the Maoist revolution post-1949 to create its own distinctive form of socialism, which actually bore a close resemblance to Soviet communism. And we could argue whether there's anything like socialism left in China of today and whether the changes that began after Mao died um, really have led from state socialism, a form of socialism, to what we might say now is a form of capitalism. But anyway, they still talk about socialism in China. Hmm. Yeah, and then we have Europe. Now, Europe had a strong communist parties and it had some social democratic parties in many parts of northern Europe. So Scandinavia is known, of course, as we talked about last time, 
for its social democracy, for capitalism with a lot of guarantees and securities for a large, for a majority of the population. A lot of public services. So it basically is capitalism with a socialist face, but it is definitely still capitalism. The communist parties in Europe, and mainly the ones in more southern Europe, they fought in the, in the 1970s, and 19, well, 1970s and to some extent in the 80s, for what they called Euro-communism, Euro a new form of communism that actually made major compromises, major compromises with capitalism. And then they dissolved, those, those communist parties more or less, more or less dissolved when the Soviet Union collapsed. And then we do now see in Latin America a new wave of socialism, what they call pink socialism. And it's a form of socialism that comes, not like in Nicaragua you came in 1979 through revolution, overthrowing of the state, the Sandinista, uh, the uh, Nicaraguan state, but... They now come through the ballot box. And you get the sorts of socialism in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, uh, in Brazil, in Ecuador. It's probably more capitalism than socialism. Very difficult to build socialism in, 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 in the world today, as Marx said in the German ideology. Socialism in one country is almost impossible. But anyway, there's talk about socialism, at least, in these countries. So what I'm trying to suggest to you that as long as capitalism reproduces itself, it also produces visions of an alternative, visions of socialism, different visions in different places. That was my long point number one. Ha <laughs> ha. Point number two, which is now a summary of where we were with Marx and Engels, three criticisms. Katie, do you remember the three criticisms? No, you don't. Okay. Anybody remember any of the criticisms? Yes, Casey. An undeveloped theory of the state. An undeveloped theory of the state, Jonathan. Sorry? There's no theory of transition or an unbelievable theory of transition. And, Ariel? A false or a, let's call it a flawed, flawed. False is a bit strong, though I'm sure I said that. Flawed theory of class struggle. And those three problems are the very problems that will define the way that we will treat Lenin, Gramsci, and Fanon. Lenin, in particular, is going to deal with the problem of the state and the problem of transition. Just as Gramsci is going to deal with the problem of the state and struggle, and Fanon is going to deal with the problem of transition and struggle. Good, that's point number two. Point number three. Well, we had a lot, of, we talked quite a bit last time about German Marxism between 1890 and 1920. And what I said was that there were these orthodox, so-called orthodox Marxists who believed in the story that Marx and Engels told about the inevitable fettering of the forces of production under capitalism, that there would be some final crisis, that they believed in what a breakdown theory of capitalism. They are Karl Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg. Kautsky, however, said, look, you know, the breakdown is not here. We have to wait patiently. We have to engage in polit politics of reform, build the strength of the Socialist Party. Luxembourg, much more impatient. She says, no, the crisis, the final crisis is here, and if we don't organize outside Parliament in a radical revolutionary way, we will enter barbarism and not move to socialism. The issue was, where are we on the curve? Are we at the point of final fettering or not? That's breakdown theory. Now, I suggested that actually, even within the German Marxism, there were those who seen the world around them, decided that in fact capitalism was not destined to break down, that capitalism has this extraordinary capacity to reconstruct itself in the face of the crisis it generates. And the best example of that, and the most famous example, is the evolutionary socialism of Bernstein, who basically said that capitalism will lead to forms of struggle that will actually reshape capitalism so it becomes ever more like socialism, communism. That in overcoming the crises it develops, 
actually capitalism will evolve into socialism. Very convenient. Don't need a revolution. No, don't need a revolution. And in fact, revolutions for Bernstein can only bring disasters because they're going to be revolutions of a minority that will bring about not democracy, but dictatorship. So, it is in this tradition <clears throat> of the absence of a clear economic breakdown of capitalism that Lenin, Gramsci, and Fanon enter. All of them, in a sense, cannot really make a convincing case to themselves that capitalism is destined to destroy itself through economic processes. And therefore, and therefore, if we are going to move beyond capitalism, we have to emphasize the political and ideological struggles. The economy will not deliver the future. So, Lenin, Gramsci, and Fanon will believe in the importance of a revolutionary transformation of capitalism and will place great emphasis on politics and ideology and on struggle. Yes. Okay. Very good. That's point number three. And finally, point number four. Russian Marxism. I'm very sorry about the film. It seems that the loudspeakers in this room basically sort of direct sound to the back. But anyway, let me summarize what you should have got from that film, which is available also on YouTube. Russian Marxism. Again, you get different Marxisms in different countries according to the political and economic context. What is the most salient thing about Russia in 1917 is that it is ruled by an absolutist leader, the Tsar, sort of an authoritarian regime, and its economic base is a semi-feudal economy in which you have serfs subordinated to what we might call lords. What happens is, Russia gets involved in the First World War, loses, or, begin, or is losing in 1917. The troops, who are the troops? The peasantry largely, but some workers, but mainly the peasantry, very demoralized, come home, very exasperated, seething with revolution, along with a working class that is also working under very difficult circumstances. So 1917, February, the overthrow, a revolutionary overthrow of the Tsarist regime. A provisional government comes into play, which has sort of aspirations to be a sort of Western liberal democracy. But still, the struggles <coughs> continue through 1917. Blimey, I can't believe my voice is going this time in the semester. Anyway, water? Oh. Oh. A gift from heaven. You know this water is good. <laughs> yeah. Mm, lovely water. Very spicy. Yes. Yes. So, <clears throat> so 1917, February. Then, through February to October, there is mounting struggle. Lenin goes into hiding. And this revolution takes place in October, led by the Bolsheviks. But this is, can't be a revolution to socialism. All the orthodox Marxists in Russia say, no, this can only be a movement from feudalism to what? To capitalism. You can't jump stages. And Lenin says, no. Well, I've been away. He says in April 1917, while well, I've been away, I've been thinking and reading, and observing, and reading the Wall Street Journal. And I know that capitalism, world capitalism, is about to collapse. We just have to mount the revolution in Russia, and it will be the trigger that will dynamite a world revolution, particularly in Europe, particularly in Germany. Hmm. And so, on those grounds, Lenin, and the Bolshevik party seized power in 1917. Trouble was, he was wrong. 
He was wrong that there was being, that turned out to be no revolution in Germany. There were attempts, there were attempts, and there was a sort of revolution. If we watch the film of Rosa Luxemburg, we'll see a sort of revolution in Germany, but it didn't really introduce a transformed capitalism. It was a more social democratic, social, uh, uh, sort of capitalism with a small socialist face, the so-called Weimar Republic. But basically, it didn't come to the rescue of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, as he had hoped. And so Russia was left alone to fight. So what could it do? It could sort of give up the project of socialism, or it could postpone it. It decided to postpone it, to build up the economy, to build up the economy, actually with market forces, so that they could have the economic base that would be necessary for communism or socialism. Well, they tried that through the 1920s. It failed. Stalin took power in 28, 29, after killing off all his opponents, and introduced what was really radical at the time, collectivization of agriculture and five-year economic plans. And with it, the decimation of the peasantry. It is calculated that perhaps almost 20 million people died as a result of this experiment in communism in the 20th century, in the Soviet Union, starting with 1917 and going on to 1991. And the peasantry were the biggest casualty because they were dispossessed of their land and left to starve. Yeah. So, that's the story of Russian Marxism. And I think the question we have to ask, in this course at any rate, is why there was no revolution in the West, and why was Lenin wrong? Why was Lenin wrong? And the answer will be found with Antonio Gramsci. So you have to wait for that answer. For now, we're going to talk about Lenin's theory of revolution. Yep which is 